Welcome to Thou Shalt Not Suffer, the Witch Trial Podcast. I'm Josh Hutchinson. And I'm Sarah Jack. This is part four of our Connecticut Witch Trials 101 series. In this episode, we discuss the Hartford Witch Hunt of 1662 to 1665, commonly referred to as the Hartford Witch Panic. During this witch hunt, 14 people were accused of witchcraft. Four married couples, five women, and one man. It's notable that Governor John Winthrop Jr. was away negotiating a colonial charter with King Charles II at the onset of the witch hunt. However, his replacement, Deputy Governor Major John Mason, is not listed in the court records associated with these cases. There is no indication that he served as a magistrate on any of the witch trials. His greatest contribution was his lack of action to stop the witch hunt. Under his watch, four convicted of witchcraft were executed. Colonial officials listed on the records included magistrates Mr. Allen, Samuel Willis, Captain John Talcott, Lieutenant John Allen, Daniel Clark, Mr. Treat, and Mr. Walcott. Physician Bray Rossiter, assisted by Mr. William Pitkins. Grand jurors were William Wadsworth, Thomas Wells, Benjamin Newberry, Joseph Fitch, William Pickens, James Steele, William Hayden, John Bissell, Samuel Wells, John Kilburn, Anthony Hawkins, and Benedict Albert. And trial jurors were Edward Griswold, Lieutenant Walter Filer, Ensign Olmstead, Samuel Borman, Gregory Winterton, John Cowles, Samuel Marshall, Samuel Hale, Nathaniel Willett, John Hart, John Wadsworth, Robert Webster, and John Gilbert. And ministers Samuel Stone, Samuel Hooker, Joseph Paines, and John Whiting were witnesses to this position of Anne Cole. We interrupt your regularly scheduled podcast with a special report. We have wonderful news. House Joint Resolution 34, Resolution Concerning Certain Witchcraft Convictions in Colonial Connecticut, has been passed by the Connecticut House of Representatives. The measure to absolve those accused of witchcraft passed by a margin of 121 to 30. Hooray! Hooray! HJ 34 now moves on to the Senate for a vote. Please continue to write to Connecticut Senators. We can't assume the measure will pass the Senate. And we want to make sure it does. We will keep you posted on further developments. Thank you, everyone who has contributed to this effort. Keep up the good work. The two chief accusers were the allegedly bewitched Elizabeth Kelly and the allegedly possessed Ann Cole. Elizabeth Kelly was the eight-year-old daughter of John and Bessiah Kelly of Hartford. Her father turned 59 the year the trouble started. Her mother was about 23. Some speculate that John Kelly was an alcoholic. However, this is based upon a single conviction for drunkenness in June of 1661. Bethiah Kelly was a daughter of Samuel Wakeman, who died when she was a toddler. Wakeman left behind 40 pounds for his oldest child, a son, and 20 pounds each for his three daughters. Two years after Wakeman's death, his widow married Nathaniel Willett. While Bethiah Wakeman Kelly was due her 20 pounds upon her 18th birthday, she had not yet received it as of the events in the story. John Kelly was not a landowner and was valued at 14 pounds, 11 shillings, and 9 pence upon his death. Elizabeth Kelly's aunt, Hannah Wakeman Hackleton, was abandoned by her husband Francis, a debtor, whose estate was claimed by Samuel Marshfield, son of Goody Marshfield, who had been accused of witchcraft up the Connecticut River in Springfield, Massachusetts. Hannah later faced legal challenges and was herself accused of being a witch in New York in 1673. We'll have more on that later, but first the story of Elizabeth Kelly's afflictions. On Sunday, March 23rd, 1662, Elizabeth Kelly awoke in good health, as usual. She spent the morning with her grandmother, 
but came home before noon, accompanied by the wife of William Ayers. The visitor ate broth straight from a hot pot and encouraged the girl to do the same. Her parents protested. But she ate the hot broth anyway. After eating the hot broth, Elizabeth complained of pain in her belly. Her father medicated her with what he described as a small dose of the powder of Angelica root. Does that mean he was a healer? No, it doesn't mean he was a healer. Families kept medicinal herbs the way we keep certain curatives in our medicine cabinets. The daughter reportedly felt well after she received the herb. And the family went to afternoon meeting together. All was well when the lights went out. But three hours later, the girl awoke. According to her father, she cried out, Father, father, help me. Good wife Ayers is upon me. She chokes me. She kneels on my belly. She will break my bowels. She pinches me. She will make me black and blue. Oh, father, will you not help me? She does seem to experience having a vision of a witch being upon her during her sleep. And people who've reported being hag written describe seeing just such a sight of witch on them and they're unable to move, but they feel pain and the witch hurts them. What did her dad do after this complaint? He told her to lie back down and be quiet so she wouldn't wake her mother. The girl did as she was told. But then she woke up and screamed even louder about good wife airs afflicting her. This time, dad carried Elizabeth away and put her in her mother's bed. The young girl continued complaining about Goody Ayers torturing her. She said, Goody Ayers torments me. She pricks me with pins. She will kill me. Oh, father, set on the great furnace and scald her. Get the broad axe and cut off her head. If you cannot get a broad axe, get the narrow axe and chop off her head. The parents, quote, used what physical helps we could obtain and that without delay meaning they likely gave her additional medicinals. Unfortunately, none of these physical helps worked for the girl, and she continued to suffer the next day. Matthias Kelly reported that she was at home with the wives of Thomas Waples and Nathaniel Greensmith on Tuesday when Goodwife Ayers came to visit Elizabeth. While Ayers was there, the girl slept peacefully and seemed to be okay. But that night, Elizabeth told her parents Goodwife Ayers had promised to give her fine lace if she stopped accusing her of witchcraft. She encouraged her father to complain to the magistrates about Goodwife Ayers. Her condition continued to be poor Wednesday. At some point, she told her parents, Goodwife Ayers chokes me. Then she was speechless. Later that night, she passed away. Was she bewitched to death? Or is there a simpler explanation for her passing? Her symptoms matched those of poisoning. It is possible that she was indeed poisoned, but likely not deliberately. Remember the Angelica root? Her father gave her some to calm her stomach. But Angelica can easily be mistaken for other plants. Poisonous plants. Including hemlock. Do you think John Kelly had obtained the powdered root of the wrong plant? It's plausible. I agree. The symptoms of hemlock poisoning follow the same pattern described by her parents. According to the National Capital Poison Center, hemlock poisoning in humans, quote, affects the nervous system and causes tremors, paralysis, and breathing difficulties. Muscle damage and kidney failure may occur in severe cases. The Cleveland Clinic says symptoms include restlessness or confusion, muscle weakness, muscle paralysis, and muscle death. The muscular paralysis can lead to the loss of the speech. This is followed by respiratory failure. And then death due to a shortage of oxygen. While it would be impossible to diagnose Elizabeth Kelly 361 years after the fact, it does at least seem plausible she may have been poisoned accidentally. What we do know is that the story didn't end there. Not by a long shot. Following the death of Elizabeth Kelly, her parents invited the neighbors to come and view the body. They were asked to take notes of what they saw. 
After he laid his daughter's body on the form, John Kelly asked Goodwife Ayers to wipe a little something from the girl's mouth. Next, Goodman Kelly asked Goodwife Ayers to roll up Elizabeth's sleeve. However, the sleeve was too tight. John Kelly tore both of the girl's sleeves and showed the assembled crowd the backs of her arms. Witnesses later stated the arms were black and blue from elbow to shoulder. They described seeing the appearance of bruising or the marks of a beating. Now the body was rolled onto its right side, then onto the belly. A noxious odor came from the body, driving some witnesses out of the room. The body was placed in a coffin, and John called everyone back to the room. He asked the witnesses to look upon the child's face. A large red spot had appeared on the right cheek. Which happened to be near where Goodwife Ayers stood. At this time, it was believed that the body of a murder victim would react to the touch of the murderer. And here a large spot indicated that Ayers was the culprit. Just as the Kelly stated, Elizabeth had told them. Now Magistrate Samuel Willis ordered an autopsy to be performed by physician Bray Rossiter with help from Mr. William Pitkins. Rossiter wrote out his findings. Rossiter and Pitkins swore to the truth of the document before the magistrates on March 31st. According to Rossiter, he found six, quote, particulars cut or natural. The body was limber. The skin inside the abdomen was dark blue, yet no sign of illness was found in the bowels. Blood had pulled in the throat, but was not coagulated. Blood had pulled in the back of the arm. The gallbladder was broken. The throat was constricted and a large key could not be pushed through the opening. Modern historians believe Rossiter mistook signs of decomposition for signs of the preternatural. Because the autopsy report does not specify the date the body was examined, it is impossible to know how badly the body would have decomposed. The body had been decaying since the 26th. This autopsy report has been used in more recent times to diagnose Elizabeth Kelly with diseases, including bronchopneumonia and diphtheria epiglottis. At this point, it's unclear to us what actually caused the death of Elizabeth Kelly. The one thing that we do know is that it wasn't caused by witchcraft. The hemlock theory came about because Sarah and I were researching the uses of angelica root and discovered that it is commonly confused for hemlock and other related plants that are toxic to humans and animals. It's a working theory. We think it's plausible, but there's no real solid evidence. Even though people have tried to diagnose Elizabeth Kelly years after the fact, it's really difficult to say, based on Bray Rossiter's autopsy report, what actually happened. When Rebecca Greensmith testified against her husband, she alleged several other individuals as a witch, including Goodwife Ayers, whom she claimed was at a party with her in the woods drinking sack. In this testimony, she named her husband Nathaniel Greensmith, Goodwife Seeger, Goodwife Sanford, Goodwife Ayers, James Wakeley, Peter Grant's wife, Henry Palmer's wife, and Judith Farlett. William and Goodwife Ayers were arrested for witchcraft in 1662. They fled Hartford when they were accused. Around the same time that Elizabeth Kelly fell ill, a young woman in Hartford began behaving rather strangely. The supposedly possessed Anne Cole, the other accuser of the Hartford witch hunt, was probably unmarried, living with her godly father's family, John Cole. It is suggested that she may be in her early 20s. David D. Hall states that the origins of the Hartford witch hunt can be traced back to her when she began to suffer diabolical possession. The store of Cole's afflictions came from minister correspondent. One such letter, after the fact, at least 20 years. It was a letter from minister John Whiting to minister Increase Mather in Boston. In that letter, Whiting admits he has lost the notes he took during his observations of Anne, but gave details anyways to two decades later. Because he had lost his Anne Cole notes, he was expecting Increase to get reports from others that he had beckoned to share reports. We have no additional reports today. The other minister interrogators leading the investigation of this hunt included the elder minister, 
Samuel Stone of Hartford, the young Sam Hooker of Farmington, the young Joseph Haynes, a Presbyterian of Hartford, and the young John Whiting of Hartford. These ministers were not all Congregationalists. Haynes was a Presbyterian minister. Ann Cole is said to have spoken about, quote, a company of familiars of the evil one. Although we don't know their names, it is told that she named them. The names must have been lost with the notes. Ann is reported to have said that it was the intention of the familiars and the evil one to stop her from getting married. To ruin her name. And to afflict her body. Anne's verbal behavior was troubling to the minister. She muttered unintelligibly, which we know from several other trials is viewed suspiciously. In this case, it was the accuser muttering and not the accused. Muttering at this time was dangerous. could easily get you accused of speaking curses. Also, to the minister's dismay, Anne spoke about the witches with a Dutch tone. Reverend Stone described the accent as troubling. He said Anne had not been exposed to the Dutch dialect in a way that she should be able to imitate it. Stone claimed this was unusual, even though he was aware that Anne gave details with a Dutch tone regarding an unnamed afflicted girl who was the neighbor of some Dutch. Samuel Stone would likely have known the unnamed girl and would have known that Anne was also familiar with her and therefore the Dutch accent of her neighbor. She was contriving with artifice to make a case. The ministers prevaricated that the Dutch tone indicated that the possessing demonic voice within Anne was confirming the accused people were witches. Also, it is reported that several times Anne had violent bodily motions and caused interruptions in church. Afflictions in church were done by Anne and two other afflicted women. The behavior was so upsetting, a godly woman is reported to have fainted. In her fits, Anne named her tormentors as Elizabeth Seeger and Rebecca Greensmith. Anne Cole lived next to Rebecca Greensmith, who was specifically characterized negatively by Reverend Whiting as considerably aged. She was widowed twice, married to Abraham Elson and then Jarvis Mudge. The accused witch, Elizabeth Seeger, insisted that Minister Haynes' account of Anne's accusations against her was a great deal of hodgepodge. Ministers Haynes and Whiting took notes from interviewing Anne and confronted Rebecca Greensmith while she was in jail on the, on the charges Anne Cole had reported to them. Rebecca confirmed with a detailed narrative. Later, after the minister interrogation that led to her confession, Rebecca told an unnamed jail visitor essentially that after so much pressure from Whiting, she could have torn him to pieces that she had to yield from the pressure. She basically says the quote, but then she says something about she had to confess. She was compelled to confess. When Mr. Haynes began to read, she could have torn him in pieces and was as much resolved as might be to deny her guilt, as she had done before. Yet after he had read a while, she was as if her flesh had been pulled from her bones, such was her expression, and so could not deny any longer. Whiting confirms to Increase Mather in his 1682 letter that Anne went on to live so successfully because the witches had been executed or had fled. According to Whiting, Anne went on to marry, was a godly church woman, and had children of her own. Whatever was really responsible for the afflictions of Elizabeth Kelly and Anne Cole, testimony soon poured in. Joseph Marsh testified that he was present when Goody Ayers promised Elizabeth Kelly a hoary lace in exchange for the girl's silence. Samuel Burr and his mother testified that Goody Ayers had once told them about a time when she met the devil while she lived in London. Robert Stern claimed he had seen Elizabeth Seeger and three other women in the woods dancing around a kettle with, quote, two black creatures like two Indians, but taller. He claimed to see Rebecca Greensmith among the women, who he knew by their habit or clothes. Goodwife Greensmith allegedly cried out, look who is yonder, and the four women ran away up a hill. The mysterious black, quote, things approached Stern, but he left to go home. 
Maria Screech testified that Goodwife Stedman had told her that Mr. John Blackleach had bewitched Screech's sow as he had done to several of her own. Hannah Robbins testified that her father believed Goody Palmer was responsible for his wife's death. She also stated that her sister Mary had complained of witches during her fatal illness. According to Hannah, Catherine Harrison and Goody Palmer were both present during her mother's final illness. John Robbins warned Palmer away several times, but she continued to, quote, thrust herself into the company. Alice Wakely, wife of James Wakely, testified that Miss Robbins' body was very stiff during her sickness, but became very limber once she passed. Andrew Sanford was indicted on June 6, 1662. The jury would not agree on a verdict. Some thought he was guilty, others only suspected he was. Andrew was released. His wife Mary was indicted on June 13, 1662. She was to suffer a different fate than her husband. The jury found her guilty as charged. She was likely hanged within days of the verdict. Rebecca and Nathaniel Greensmith were both indicted on December 30th, 1662. Both were found guilty. Rebecca had confessed. And she had delayed Nathaniel. Rebecca and Nathaniel were probably hanged together in January 1663. The same court ordered the treasurer to take the estate of William Ayers. William Ayers had fled the colony. The court gave Ayers' son, John Ayers, to James Insign to serve as apprentice until he reached the age of 21. John had to grow up without his parents from the age of about eight or nine. He was released from servitude on March 3rd, 1675. Next, the court convened on January 6, 1663, to hear the cases against Mary Barnes and Elizabeth Seeger. Mary Barnes pleaded not guilty. The jury convicted her. Elizabeth Seeger also pleaded not guilty. She was acquitted. The jurors who believed her to be guilty submitted a written statement on January 12, 1663, explaining why they would have convicted her. She had been acquainted with people who had recently been accused of witchcraft. Including Mary Sanford and goodwife Hares. One of whom had been executed, the other had escaped. Seeker had learned to knit from one of these other women. Magistrate John Allen pressed Seeker on this knitting issue. And Seeker eventually admitted she knew the woman better than she'd been leading them to believe. Elizabeth Seeker claimed she hated goodwife Ayers. But the jury wasn't buying it. At one point, Goodwife Seeger said, quote, they seek my innocent blood. John Allen asked, who? Eager said, quote, everybody. When she was told she might be tried by swimming, she replied, the devil that caused me to come here can keep me up. The majority of jurors did not believe accusations of flying had been proved legally. The same court of January 6, 1663, decided to sequester Scabie James Wakeley's estate, but allow his wife Alice to maintain the use of the property for the time being. Mary Barnes was hanged on January 25, 1663. She was the last person hanged for witchcraft in Connecticut. On March 5, 1663, the quarterly court held in Hartford awarded jailer Daniel Garrett 21 shillings for keeping Mary Barnes for three weeks. Thomas Barnes was charged for this expense. Garrett earned six shillings a week plus unspecified fees for keeping the greensmiths. The length of their imprisonment is not disclosed in the document. However, it is possible they and Mary Barnes remain jail until the 25th of January. The March 5 court ordered the continuation of the sequestration of James Wakeley's estate. Of the six people tried for witchcraft during the Hartford witch hunt, Four were convicted and two were narrowly acquitted. The hunt entered a new phase following the January 1663 executions. Accusers were no longer actively naming witches. However, the witch hunt did not entirely die off. And Elizabeth Seeger's tribulations were far from over. She was indicted for three crimes. Witchcraft, blasphemy, and adultery. She pleaded not guilty. The court acquitted her on the witchcraft and blasphemy charges, but convicted her of adultery 
on July 2nd, 1663. And John M. Taylor says that she got everything that was coming to her in the courts. And Moyer says Mary Barnes may have been charged with adultery. That might be what the arrest warrant was issued for in 1649. And it does seem like many of these women had a scandalous, according to their neighbors, past, and that there was at least gossip and rumor about their moral turpitude. Elizabeth was tried again for witchcraft on June 26, 1665. This time, she was convicted. Mrs. Miggett testified that Elizabeth Seeger attempted to recruit her to be a witch. Seeger allegedly said, quote, God was not, God was not, it was very good to be a witch. And, she should not need fear going to hell, for she should not burn in the fire. Miggett also claimed Seeger once muttered something unintelligible, which caused Miggett to flee in terror. Mrs. Miggett further stated that, quote, a little before the flood this spring, Goodwife Seeger came into their house on a moonshiny night and took her by the hand and struck her on the face as she was in bed with her husband, whom she could not wake. And then Goodwife Seeger went away and Mrs. Miggett went to the door, but dares not look out after her. Daniel and Margaret Garrett testified that Goodwife Seeger had told them she had sent Satan to tell people she was not a witch. Goodwife Garrett said she asked Seeger why she had, quote, made use of Satan to tell them why did she not beseech God to tell them she was no witch. Seeger replied that Satan knew she was no witch. Edward Stebbing, Stephen Hart Sr., and Josiah Willard testified that Goodwife had used scripture to justify her sending Satan. She had cited Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 16. Acts 19.13, King James Bible, quote, The certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. Verse 14. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. Verse 15, quote, And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? Verse 16, And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Sager was saying she had commanded Satan with the authority of Jesus' name to tell her neighbors that he did not know her. He knew she was not one of his own. According to Goodwife Garrett, William Edwards told Elizabeth Sager that she flew. She replied that Edwards made her fly. Goodwife Garrett then told Sager, you own you did fly. Goodwife Sager replied, if I did fly, William Edward made me fly. Goodman Garrett confirmed his wife's testimony. Goodwife Garrett then told a story about a good cheese gone bad. She said she had once made a most excellent cheese at a time when Goodwife Seeger was husking corn in the Garrett barn. Garrett asked her husband to bring her the special cheese. When she got the cheese, one side was filled with maggots. Garrett cut off the bad part and threw it in the fire. At that moment, Elizabeth Seeger cried out in pain so loudly that Garrett heard her from the house. Seeger then came into the home, crying of pain. She sat, bringing her body and crying out, What do I ail? What do I ail? Goodman Garrett again confirmed his wife's testimony. This is another instance of the folk belief that witches reacted when objects they'd bewitched were burned. Goodwife Watson said that when she told Elizabeth Seeger that Anne Cole's mother wanted to see her, Seeger replied that she knew Anne was crying out against her. Seeger said, they missed their mark. They aimed at me. Why do they not lay hold of others as well as me? Why do they lay hold of the chief actor herself? Watson replied, if you know others to be chief, why do you not discover them? Seeger said, she would in due time. On July 8th, 1665, Governor John Withrop Jr. met with magistrates to discuss the cases of Hannah Wakeman Hackleton and Elizabeth Seeger, who had both been convicted of felonies and faced the death penalty. The governor declared that it was his desire that the matter might be respited to a further consideration for advice in those matters that were to him so obscure and ambiguous, and the issue is deferred. 
On May 18, 1666, Elizabeth Seeger was finally released from imprisonment. At a special session, the Court of Assistance declared that the jury's guilty verdict did, quote, not legally answer the indictment. In addition to the trials of six witchcraft suspects, eight other individuals were caught up in the web of accusations. Some moved before being arrested, others managed to escape, and one couple may have sued their accusers to escape prosecution. According to Increase Mather, who wrote of the incident in his 1684 book, an essay for the recording of illustrious providences, a man and woman named by Ann Cole were forced to undergo the swimming test. The two had their hands and feet bound and were thrown in the water. Rather than sink, as an innocent person would do, each of these victims floated, quote, after the manner of a buoy, part under, part above the water. A witness volunteered to be the guinea pig in an experiment to see if an innocent person would also float like a buoy. After being gently laid on the water, he immediately sunk right down. Mather went on to write that the swimming test was not admitted as legal evidence. And they were not, quote, proceeded against on any other account. Mather ends by saying the couple, quote, very fairly took their flight, not having been seen in that part of the world since. This last comment leads to theories that the mystery couple was the heirs who escaped. The other couples involved were the Sanfords, Greensmiths, and Black Bleaches, and none of them took flight. No recorded indictments exist to show that the Black Bleaches were ever proceeded against. However, they did not need to flee in order to escape trial. Mr. John Blackleach was a prominent figure in the community. When John died in 1683, his estate was valued at 374 pounds. And he had likely already given portions to his adult children. Judith Farlett, a Dutch woman, was another person arrested for witchcraft in 1662. She was released when Connecticut officials received a letter from her brother-in-law, who happened to be New Netherlands Governor Peter Stuyvesant. Judith moved to New Netherlands after she was freed. Later, she married Nicholas Bayard and lived on High Street in Manhattan. Another accused person, James Wakeley, escaped to Rhode Island. He left behind his wife Alice and his children. His estate was sequestered, but his wife was allowed to continue to use it. He came back to Connecticut in 1665. But was met by renewed allegations of witchcraft. He turned around and returned to Rhode Island. As we mentioned last week, Henry Palmer and his wife also fled the Hartford witch hunt. They likely settled in Rhode Island, where Henry Palmer successfully sued Stephen Seabier for calling his wife a witch in 1673. No indictment is known to have been issued in the case of Peter Grant's wife. There's more to the Anne Poole story. In April 1664, her family was visited by great tragedy, and old friends paid her a visit. According to Increase Mather, in his book, An Essay for the Recording of Illustrious Providences, wherein an account is given of many remarkable and very memorable events which have happened this last age, especially in New England, Mather writes, on the 28th of April, A.D. 1664, a company of the neighbors being met together at the house of Henry Conliffe in Northampton in New England to spend a few hours in Christian conferences and in prayer, there happened a storm of thunder and rain. And as the good man of the house was at prayer, there came a ball of lightning in at the roof of the house which set the thatch on fire, grated on the timber pierced through the chamber floor, no breach being made on the boards, only one of the joists somewhat raised. Matthew Cole, who was son-in-law to the said Conliffe, was struck stone dead as he was leaning over table and joining with the rest in prayer. He did not stir nor groan after he was smitten, but continued standing as before, bearing upon the table. There was no visible impression on his body or clothes. Only the sole of one of his shoes was rent from the upper leather. There were about twelve persons in the room, 
None else received any harm. Only one woman, who is still living, was struck upon the head, which occasioned some deafness ever since. The fire on the house was quenched by the seasonable help of neighbors. And Mather also writes, For I am informed that when Matthew Cole was killed with the lightning at Northampton, the demon which disturbed his sister Anne Cole, 40 miles distant in Hartford, spoke of it, intimating their concurrence in that terrible accident. And so ends the story of the Hartford witch hunt. Here's Mary with a minute with Mary. Goody Bassett. Goody is short for good wife. This term referred to a married woman of middle to lower class in colonial times, and it was often how women were referred to in the court records. Goody Bassett was one of those women. The only reason historians know of her existence is because Goody was most likely hanged for a crime she did not commit, witchcraft. Historians only know that fact based on one surviving colonial court record, which stated, and I quote, the governor, Mr. Kulik, and Mr. Clark are desired to go down to Stratford to keep court upon the trial of Goody Bassett for her life, end quote. That's it. One court record. Nothing else exists of which we know. I understand the patriarchal society of the time. However, my heart today remains baffled that the court clerk did not identify Goody by her given name. She was a unique person who lived and breathed and led a meaningful life. Goody was loved by her family. She was a wife and a daughter to people who cared about her. Guess what? There are people who still care about Goody. We are the army of activists, historians, and descendants, and politicians who are working tirelessly to overturn the convictions of Goody and all of those falsely convicted of witchcraft in colonial Connecticut. We care. My goal and the goal of my colleagues, Sarah Jack, Joshua Hutchinson, Beth Caruso, Tony Griego, State Representative Jane Garibay, and State Senator Dr. Saud Anwar, is to find out Goody Bassett's given name to her at birth so that she can one day be identified as a person in her own right. Not only that, but we plan to identify all of the goodies who have yet to be properly identified with their given names. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And now here's Sarah with In Witch Hunts News. And witch hunts news. Actual witch hunts are occurring weekly. Witch hunts are still targeted blame and punishment toward vulnerable people for misunderstood circumstances. Here's a headline from Ghana. Mother of seven, an elderly man lynched on witchcraft suspicion in Zach Palsy. It does not get easier to tell you about these individuals and what happens to them. It's horrific. Here's the report. On Sunday, May 7th, 2023, in the farming community of Zach Palsy, located in the Mian district of the northern region Ghana, two individuals were allegedly lynched on suspicion of practicing witchcraft. The victims were identified as Aimoro Safura, a middle-aged mother of seven, believed to be in her 40s, and Mbachirvo, a man in his early 60s. According to reports from sources within the Zach Palsy community, Aimoro Safura sought refuge at the forecourt of the Zach Palsy chief palace but she was chased down and lynched there. Mba Chirfo, on the other hand, was killed at his residence. The community members accused both individuals of allegedly causing sickness for a woman by employing the services of a soothsayer. In response to the accusation, the youth of the community organized themselves and launched an attack on the two victims, leading to their tragic deaths. It is worth noting that both of the victims denied the allegations. What were you doing on Sunday, May 7th? I was meeting with Dr. Lee Wigwe for the first time in person. He is visiting the United States and doing talks on humanism, religious freedom, and witch hunts. He happened to kick it off in Denver, where I am. That was a great surprise. It was an exciting moment for me to get to meet Leo face-to-face and connect with him about all that is going on in our world around witch phobia. Next week, co-host Josh Hutchinson, myself, and Dr. Igwe will be visiting witch trial historical sites in the Salem and Hartford area. Leo will be giving talks about his work with alleged witch victims like Amaro and Mba. 
When he is on the ground in Nigeria, he intercedes on their behalf with support from NGOs and advocacy for alleged witches. He negotiates for local government services and safety through the authorities if the victim is lucky enough to reach protection. Amora was not. Did you catch that she fled to the community leader and was still lynched there by the angry youth? Dr. Leo personally checks on attack victims, goes to them, connects with them, and makes sure they know that they are not alone. He does this for the survivors. Just a glance at the weekly news reveals that many are murdered and do not get a chance to start over or to meet Leo. You can have the opportunity to meet this great advocate. Please come see us May 16th through the 18th at one of his talks. Power structures around religion, familial status, age, gender, and falsely attributed causes of misfortune universally contribute to circumstances like these and fuel witch hunts past and present. You can learn more about the past and modern stories of the people harmed by this merciless conduct in any of our expert-filled episodes. Join us every week to hear the latest important conversation. The accusation details from witch trial primary sources are jaw-dropping. The news of current attack victims across the globe is jaw-dropping. We ask, why do we hunt witches? How do we hunt witches? How do we stop hunting witches? Messaging that clarifies how power structures around religion, familial status, age, gender, and falsely attributed causes of misfortune universally contribute to the circumstances of witch hunts past and present. Share the attack news. Share a podcast episode. Read a book. Write a post or blog. Write to a politician or diplomat. Donate money to the organizations that are creating projects that intervene in the modern communities where witch hunts thrive. You can financially support the production of the podcast. This is the month that the Salem, Massachusetts area and Hartford and Farmington, Connecticut are getting a rare and important visit from Dr. Leo Igwe, director of the Advocacy for Alleged Wishes nonprofit organization. It is an incredible honor for Josh and myself to organize a week of speaking engagements during his speaking tour in the United States and to accompany him as he speaks in places of historical significance to early American colony witch trial history. You can follow Dr. Leo Igwe on Twitter at Leo Igwe to see how he is advocating on the ground in the victim communities in real time as these individuals are experiencing being accused and hunted. The first event at the Salem Witch Museum is virtual, but Dr. Igwe will be with us in Salem touring the historic sites guided by a local seasoned in the history, Mary Bingham. Tuesday, May 16th, 2023 is your chance to experience a very special evening of in-person conversation with Leo at the Rebecca Nurse Homestead in Danvers. Please see the Facebook event for details. Isn't this a great week? Make sure you mark your calendars. Next, you can enjoy an in-person speaking event with Dr. Igwe at Central Connecticut State University on Wednesday, May 17th at 6 p.m. While in the Hartford area, Leo will be touring known witch trial historic sites with author Beth Caruso. On Thursday afternoon, May 18th at 4 p.m., Leo will be presenting at the Stanley Whitman House Living History Center in Farmington, Connecticut. Look for Facebook events for all of these occasions posted by our social media. Come here, Leo. Invite your friends and family. See you there. Get involved. Visit endwitchhunts.org. To support us, purchase books from our bookshop, merch from our Zazzle shop, or make a financial contribution to our organization. Our links are in the show description. Thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. And thank you for listening to Thou Shalt Not Suffer, the Witch Trial Podcast. Join us again next week. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Visit us at thoushaltnetsuffer.com. Remember to tell your friends, family, acquaintances, neighbors, and anyone you meet about the show. Please support our efforts to end witch hunts. Visit endwitchhunts.org to learn how. Have a great today and a beautiful tomorrow.